Okay, so thank you for the introduction and also thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Actually, I was going to make a comment because I, I also have to thank the UPAP because I came here in part with a travel grant for women for UPAP and when I applied, I mentioned that I work in an area where women are underrepresented, but then the organizers told me they had invited more women uh, that couldn't make it. And I'll thank them because this sort of thing is actually quite important for visibilization. So, thank, uh, I, so I work uh, in the Institute of IFLICIV, of the Physics of Liquids and Biological System, where Santiago Grijera and Daniel Cabra work. And so here, I'm not going to, take, uh, to talk about the traditional liquids, but I'm going to mention a bit about classical spin liquids, so it is a bit related to the title of the institute. So, so let me mention the collaborators about this particular work I'm presenting. One of them is Diego Rosales, who is also a researcher at IFLICIV. And the other one is Pierre Pujol from the Laboratoire de Physique Theorique in Toulouse. So uh, I also have to thank the funding from CONICET, from the University of La Plata, the NEXT program uh, from Toulouse that allowed me to visit them, and the ICAM Quantum X uh, program that allowed the visits from Diego Rosales to Toulouse. And here, is, here we are collaborating a lot and using all the grant money. So this one over here is Pierre and there is Diego. And okay, so, uh, so we have been talking a lot about uh, frustration, frustration in general and in particular in magnetic systems. We have had uh, Jose's talk yesterday and Santiago Grijera, so let me go a bit beyond, let's say, so like frustration reloaded, and let me uh, comment on what we can call highly frustrated points, okay? And why are these relevant? How are these connected with uh, probable, probable uh, spin liquids? And then I'm going to talk a bit about chirality, and in the end, how this is connected with the, our ongoing work, okay? So what I, am I talking about when I say highly, highly frustrated? So uh, we are talking about systems where you can rewrite your Hamiltonian for the Heisenberg model. And you can rewrite it in such a way that uh, it's over here, okay? So you can rewrite your Hamiltonian as the square of the sum of the spins in each plaquette. Okay, so if we are talking about a triangular lattice, the plaquette you can rewrite the Hamiltonian with is a triangle, and it's the same for Kagome. If we're talking about pyrochlor, which is uh, what Santiago Grijera talked about, for first nearest neighbors, the plaquette is a tetrahedron, okay? And this has uh, easy uh, to see consequences. If you can rewrite your Hamiltonian like this, it is very easy to minimize, right? If this is antiferromagnetic, this is quadratic, so you have the minimum when the, the total sum of the spins of the plaquette is zero. Very simple, right? So you can have a very easy ground state condition. But then, as you know, you, you, you have a lot of ways of, of what lattices are more frustrated than the other, right? Santiago Grijera mentioned about geometric frustration, and it is, I mean, the triangle is the, you, the typical example of frustration, but it is very different when you have the triangular lattice or when you have the Kagome lattice. So let us imagine here spins are the vectors with three components. So if you go to the triangular lattice and you want to satisfy this to fulfill this ground state condition, you only have to put, so you go to one triangle, and you say, okay, I all the spins have to sum up to zero. Very simple, you put a 120 arrangement, and in one triangle, you fulfill the ground state, okay? But this has to be fulfilled in all the triangles, pointing up and pointing down. So you can very easily see that once you fix one plaquette for the neighboring triangle, you only have one option for the spin. Right? It has to be like this, okay? So this means that once you fix the ground state condition for one triangle, it is fixed in all the lattice. So you don't have a lot of freedom there. And this is where Kagome is completely different, which is the same in pyrochlor, right? Because th they are corner sharing lattices. So you put your 120 arrangement of spins in one triangle, and then 
you can very, very quickly see that in all the neighboring triangles, you have two options, okay? You can either choose this pin to be here or to be here. Of course, if you close the loop, one, maybe you have to fix every now and then one of the spins, but this gives you a lot of freedom, okay? And this is connected actually with what I'm going to define as classical spin liquids. Well, I'm not going to define it, I'm going to borrow a definition, okay? So there are a lot of reviews on this in particular. There is a very, very nice uh, review on Henley on the Coulomb phase on these systems. And this is very closely related with what he had talked about. So in the pyrochrome lattice, I, the Heisenberg model is the model for a classical algebraic spin liquid. Okay, it's the classical example. It has been uh, very well studied. And actually, this idea was first introduced by Messner and Chocker about 20 years ago. And one of the characteristics of this model is that when you do a simulation and you go to low temperature simulations, what you can see is this type of structure factor, okay, which is very easy to calculate these things because this is the type of things that you can measure, you can compare with neutron scattering, okay? You can obtain this from simulations and compare it. And a very important characteristic is these very sharp things over here, okay? These are called pinch points and they are the signature of an algebraic spin liquid because of what Grigera mentioned, that you can map this a sort of Hamiltonian to a uh, gauge theory, okay? So this is related to the correlations, algebraic correlations, okay? And then the thing is that uh, you know that there are a lot of, I'm sure you all know that there are a lot of works regarding quantum spin liquids in the Kagomelatis. You can even call this, there are some very nice reviews recently where they call this the quest for spin liquids, like, like, like we, we are in an Indiana Jones movie or something, right? Everyone is looking for the holy grail of, of spin liquids. And a lot of search has been done in Kagome because it's related also to a lot of materials like Hammersmithy and a lot of other compounds. But when you go to the classical case, it is highly frustrated, it is very degenerate, but it is not this type of spin liquid, okay? And now let me um, tell you a bit more about this. So one of the ways you can see in this highly frustrated system where you have a candidate for spin liquid is you can, you can count the number of zero modes you have per plaquette. Right? This is a very simple calculation. You can profit from the fact that you can rewrite your Hamiltonian as a function of these units, these units right? which are triangles or tetrahedron in Kagome or in pyrochlor. And what you say is, okay, you can do these simple calculations where the number of degrees of freedom you will have with plaquettes, it depends on the number of spins you have, the number of components in the spin, and how many plaquettes share this uh, particular spin. If, you, if we go back and we think on the triangular lattice, each side is shared by six triangles, and in Kagome it is shared by two, right? So this is how this these uh, changes, okay? This is a way to easily see why one of them are more frustrated or have more freedom than the other. When you do this calculation, you, you say, okay, if these are the number of degrees of freedom, you can predict how, in the classical case, how the specific heat would be, right? We're talking about classical spins. So if we think about classical statistical mechanics and we think about the key partition theorem, when you would introduce fluctuations, we only have, for a three-component spin, two degrees of freedom, the two angles. So by a key partition, the specific heat per spin should be one, okay? And again, if you have an extra uh, zero mode, okay, a an extra degree of freedom, you can recalculate your specific heat of how much that specific heat would be. And if you do this calculation for the pyrochal lattice, you can see that for Heisenberg spins, which are we call the 3D, three component spins, this specific heat should be 3 over 4, 0 0.75, okay? So this is the prediction if you have this, because you have this um, freedom. But if you do this for Kagome, this is zero, so the specific heat, sh in the classical case, of course, this should be, this should go to one. The thing is, there is a um, very famous paper, like, it is briefly, is it, I mentioned it over here, but I didn't talk about it, which is at, uh, which, which talks about order by disorder in the Kagome lattice. 
And in there, they do the calculations and they predict that if you take into account thermal fluctuations, one of the quadratic modes goes to zero and actually it's quartic. So you can recalculate geostatistic heat, right? All, not all the contributions are one half. One of them is one over four. So this means that at low temperatures, when order by disorder kicks in, this should be 11 over 12. So let me show you this a bit with the literature. Again, this is, this is the pyrochor. I'm sorry, this got the other way. I don't know what happened here. So this is the pyrochor lattice, and this is the Kagome lattice. So these are published results. This in the pyrochor lattice, as I told you, this is the characteristic structure factor. It is, I, sorry, I didn't put the, this is HHL over uh, zero. And you get the characteristic pinch points, which as I mentioned, are the characteristic of this uh, algebraic liquid. And when you do the simulation for the specific heat, so you can see the specific heat goes to three over four, right, to 0 0.75, and it is completely featureless. There are no peaks, there are no transitions, right? There is, like, it is completely flat. And this is actually one of the ways to search for this sort of classical spin liquid. You do a simulation, you look at the specific heat, and you look for this kind of behavior. So the, the idea would be that the, since the ground state is super degenerate, at low temperatures, the system is fluctuating around these ground states, okay? But there is no transition. So in this sense, it, these systems are also called exclusive paramagnets. Maybe you have, you have read about this. When we studied simulations in the Kagomelagi, these are, these are results by Sitominsky. So this is the structure factor of the Kagomelagi as a function of temperature, and this is the specific heat. If you look at the specific heat, you can see this behavior is very similar to this one, and it, go, it, it seems like it's going to be flat, right? And the value is close to one, which is in agreement with the calculation we did before. But then, at a certain temperature, this goes down, and it goes to 11 over 12, which is the prediction for order by disorder, okay? So you can see again, this is flat. There is no transition, because Kagome is very degenerate. The thing is that when order by disorder kicks in, it chooses the submanifold of states that are coplanar, and uh, they are degenerate, but they are not a spin liquid. So let us look at the same thing in the structure factor. So in this phase, which it, it would be like a spin liquid, you look at the structure factor and it looks like this. And you can see this and this are very similar, right? So this looks like if, y it, if you could go a bit more, it would have these characteristic pinch points. So again, it would be an algebraic spin liquid. But then when the order by disorder kicks in, I, I can see it. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, so I'm sorry about that. But here, the structure factor changes, and in this, in the lowest temperature, you have these points over here, which are actually very sharp peaks, which are a signature of the thermal by dis order by disorder selection. These sharp peaks indicate that now there is a selection of states, okay? So let's, this is just to remind you of some of the very interesting or the classical physics you have in, in Kagome lattice, and how it is different from the pyrochlor in the sense that at low temperatures, it is not an algebraic spin liquid. Still, it is a very strong candidate for quantum spin liquids, and there have been a lot of studies around that, and of course, people have for ages gone beyond the Heisenberg model, and this is what we're going to talk about, which is what is sometimes called the extended Heisenberg model. It's extended because you just go beyond first nearest neighbors. So, as in pyrochlor, in the Kagome lattice, you have two types of third nearest neighbors, which is across the hexagon, but this is the same distance as along the bonds, right? For this particular model, we're only going to take this type of third nearest neighbors, okay? Actually, the physics changes a lot if you change both, of both uh, types of interactions or only one of third nearest neighbors. And again, this is going to... Let us review what has been done on this. A lot of work on this extended Heisenberg model has been done by Laura Mejio and Claire Lullier. They have studied the ground state with projective symmetries, and they have done a lot of studies on Schinger bosons above that. And the Donna Shen group is working also a lot in doing, for example, uh, they do a very large scale DMRG. So 
Let us review like the classical ground states. So this is the phase diagram. All um, couplings are antiferromagnetic. And you have, okay, a very uh, Q equals zero ordering over here. And these phases, which I'll call, they call them Kubok 1 and Kubok 2. So why are they called Kubok? They are called Kubok because the arrangement of spins is that the magnetic unit cell is a 12 spin magnetic unit cell. And when you map these spins that they are over here, you can put them at the center and they, they go to the vertexes of a Kubok tahedron. Okay, so to not call this Kubok tahedron phase, they call it Kubok. So what is the, so basically, the most important thing is that this Kubok phase is ordered in such a way that in this case, the second nearest neighbor's triangles, they are arranged in such a way that you have a net scalar chirality. So this is why these phases are, are interesting, okay? When you go to the Kubok 2 phase, which is the one I'm going to focus more about, this chirality is found in the uh, little triangles in the Kago lattice, okay? In the, in the unit triangles of the Kago lattice, you have a, a scalar chirality, which is defined like this. And in fact, since this is symmetric, because it is a Kubok tahedron, it, this chirality is either a certain value in one in the up triangles and the opposite value in the down triangles or uh, the other way, right? It's either plus or minus or minus and plus. So you have a chirality per triangle, but the total chirality of the ground state is zero. Okay, so this would be relevant for what we are going to talk later. And if you do a Monte Carlo simulation on this, this is interesting because you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking regarding this. It's either, so the, the system either chooses this state or the other. So you can say you have like a, a spontaneous chirality symmetry breaking. The thing is that the total chirality here is zero. However, this has uh, brought around a lot of work quite recently, as I mentioned. So the, the Donna Shen group and some people also doing uh, IPEPs and Marishan and Monte Carlo, they, are, they have been working mostly around this this line, and they have seen that along this line and a bit over here, some people claim that you have a, a quantum chiral spin liquid, okay? And so, and some people actually claim that this particular point, when they do fluctuation, it shifts over this Kubok phase, which has also chirality. So they question whether this quantum spin liquid in the typical cargo antiferromagnet might have chiral properties too. So there has been really a lot, a lot of work going on, particularly focusing on these boundary regions uh, so because these lines are degenerate, okay? So let's talk a bit more about that. Yes. So the difference is where you have your chirality. In Kubok 2, No, yes, there is chirality, but it is in the second nearest neighbors. So it would be over here. So in the Kubok 2, it is in these triangles. In the, in the other Kubok, it's in these triangles. You have to take them like this. Okay? So yes, you have chirality, but not in first nearest neighbors. If you want, you have to calculate it in second nearest neighbors. It's exactly the same way, but for second nearest neighbors. Okay? But for simplicity, I'm going to focus in the other one. But it would be exactly the same for this phase. So, uh, so what we're going to, I'm going to present here is a work we, we published with Pierre earlier this year. And the idea is, okay, let's explore a bit more on this Hamiltonian. What we want to do is we want to get more chirality, okay? And Kagome is the candidate uh, for this. So what we do is, okay, we introduce uh, what we the effect of a magnetic field, so we break some reversal symmetry, and then we introduce uh, the loshinsky morisha out of plane interaction. But we do it, so there are a lot of works on this. They, they usually put the loshinsky morisha in D, and, and this has been done. But what we do here is we propose that we put an alternate the loshinsky morisha interaction. So it has one sign in one type of triangle, in the up triangles, and it points down in the other one. So this is an idea, so the idea is to reinforce the chirality you have in this Kubok phase, okay? So 
you know that introducing this sort of anti-symmetric interaction will probably give you chirality. So let's introduce and force the chirality. And the thing is that when you put a standard, let's call it like that, Yeloshinsky-Morisha interaction, there is uh, of this uh, one lattice symmetry that remains unbroken, so you have the chance of, of um, spontaneous symmetry breaking, which I'm going to tell you the end of the story. This is basically what we see. And so what we did to study this, bes besides studying the symmetry, we did um, some a bit sophisticated Monte Carlo metropolis simulations with over relaxation and parallel tempering. And let me comment a bit on these degenerate lines. One interesting thing you can do here is you can rewrite this Hamiltonian as a function of different plaquettes. So for example, you can, so this line, these two lines are, are degenerate, they are semi-extensive and they have no net chirality. And this one where J2 is, uh, is the strongest coupling. What you have there is that the system, uh, you can basically write the Hamiltonian as three Kagome lattices. So all the physics you will get there is equivalent at low temperature to the one in the Kagome lattice. But the, there is a very interesting point in this phase diagram, which is this one, okay? This point, which is the one where the three couplings are the same, it is also a highly frustrated point. In what sense? In the sense that you can rewrite the Hamiltonian as a sum of the plaquettes. But the plaquettes here are not the triangle of the Kagome lattice. They are the hexagon in the Kagome lattice, okay? So in each plaquette, you have six spins. So this will give you a lot more freedom, okay? In fact, um, uh, there, there is a PRL by Messner last year where he, he studies the Rabi lattice and the, the ruby lattice, sorry, and the Kagome lattice in these highly frustrated points. And why are these interesting? Because they are a new type of classical spin liquid. Usually when you talk about classical spin liquids, everyone is thinking you, it is related to algebraic spin liquids. And now let me tell you why this is a different type of spin liquid. So if you do this counting, you want to count the zero modes in the plaquettes, we can go to a few slides back and do these calculations. You put how many spins you have in the plaquettes, which here is six. They are shared by two plaquettes. And when you do the mode counting, remember in pyrochlor, you have one degree of freedom per plaquette, but here you have three. So it's clearly a lot, it is very degenerate. And an interesting thing is that if you do this for, the, for X, Y, you also have degrees of freedom. So if you have something that behaves like a liquid with X, Y spins, you would suggest that you have an X, Y system that doesn't have costly toilet. So this sounds very interesting, but we didn't get into this because it, would, it is quite um, complicated to support that claim and to do some simulations. But it, it is something that might be interesting and worth noting. But so let's stuck with the three component spins to this very degenerate case. And when you do this calculation and you do your prediction for the specific heat, it is actually one half. So basically what you're saying is that half your modes do not contribute to the entropy, okay? So you, it, this, this is also support of a spin liquid and you do the simulation. These are results for several points in the phase diagram. What I want you to see clearly is the one I'm pointing with the arrow. It is this one. This is the specific heat for this particular point, and you can see again that it is completely flat, it is featureless, and at low temperatures, it goes to one half, okay? So again, you have another signature that supports you have a, a spin liquid there, but when, let's say, okay, let's look at the structure factor. The thing is that when you start to look at the geometry, and you want to do something equivalent to spin ice, okay? If you go to pyrochlor, you can think about spin ice, and you can think about the arrows, arrows going in to in to out, and that gives you an idea of the flow of charge and everything that Santiago mentioned in the first days. But when you do this for this particular plaquette, the hexagon, this cannot be done. You cannot map this, this sort of idea of the flow, okay? So, and you can see this in the structure factor. When you calculate this for Monte Carlo simulations, the structure factor has no pinch point, it has no maximum, 
it is clearly degenerate. So this is a different sort of thing. Okay, this is not an algebraic spin liquid. And as I told you, the the x y uh, behavior seems to be the same. We put a magnetic field. We look at the x y components, and we get exactly the same. Okay, so this is a different sort of spin liquid. It is it is completely different than the structure factor I showed you earlier for higher temperature Kagome or for low temperature pyrochlor. Okay. So again, why is this? So what can we do with this? We can we say it's highly degenerate. So le let's go a bit more. The thing is, it is highly degenerate, but it is so degenerate it has no. Even if it is in the union of chiral phases, it has no net chirality. But what we can do is we can profit from the work that Robert and his collaborators presented a few years ago, where they have a very nice paper, which is called like a, a family of possible of, of of Hamiltonian where you might have chiral spin liquids. So they start with the Kagome antiferromagnets, and basically what they do is they fix the Z components, and in the three sublattices of Kagome, they do uh, they rotate the X Y spins in a different way. And the thing is that this rotation maps the Kagome antiferromagnet to a Hamiltonian, which is basically an XXZ with a dialoshinsky morisha interaction. So again, if you have a dialoshinsky morisha interaction, you will probably have chirality. So in this sense, they claim that this, might, this Hamiltonian they propose, they propose several cases. Since it is, it is a symmetry mapping from Kagome antiferromagnet, in the quantum case, it would probably have quantum liquid properties. So we do the same mapping, but for the model with J1 equal J2 equal J3. And the thing is, OK, you have a, a large Hamiltonian, but basically J3 remains the same. And J1 and J2, you have an XXZ and a dialoginsky morisha interaction. OK, this would be for first nearest neighbors. This would second nearest neighbors. The thing is that this interaction will probably give you chirality under a magnetic field. And since the Z component remains the same, you can put a magnetic field, and you will have the same properties. And the thing is that remember that this point with a magnetic field also behaves like a spin liquid. And this is actually, so here we have a Hamiltonian that when we put a magnetic, uh, magnetic field, it, it will have chirality, but it will remain a spin liquid. So we can say that this is a proposal for something like a chiral classical spin liquid. Okay, so this point is, is something we are quite interested in going beyond with. So let's talk a bit more on what we explored. And let's start with the easy Deloshinsky Mauritian interaction. Okay, so it is the standard way of putting this, the Deloshinsky Mauritian interaction. And we focus on this Kubok phase, okay? The, the phase where the without the Roshinsky Morisha, without um, magnetic field, you have this staggered chirality, but the total chirality is zero. So when you put this Yeloshinsky Morisha and you put a magnetic field, here, I mean, you, you have a net chirality in the triangles. And okay, this, this changes, okay? And this it has a fixed chirality. This has a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and here you have uh, a, a net chirality. Okay, but I mean it's pretty much what was before. Let's say like that. But the thing is, when you put a staggered yeloshinsky morisha interaction, okay, like the staggered chirality in this Kubok phase, what you can see is again this this you have this symmetry. So if you have a staggered chirality and you apply this symmetry, this is a lattice spin. You remains the same, okay? So in the case of the Kubok, it would do absolutely nothing. But if you have something like this, where you have one of the type of triangles is not chiral, and the other one has some chirality, which notice that this means that the total system has a chirality, right? Because you have plus and zero, the total chirality is plus. When you apply this symmetry, the plus chirality goes to zero, and the other goes to be negative, okay? So here you have the chance to have a, chir a chiral symmetry breaking, but the total value of the chirality would be non-zero. And so this is the phase diagram for the staggered Dialoshinsky-Morisha interaction. 
this is the low temperature phase diagram. When I'm talking about low temperature, we go up to 1 to 10 to the fourth, something like that, in units of J1. So this is the magnetic field, and this is the magnitude of the Dialoshinsky mauritian interaction. So there are several phases. Here you have broken translation symmetry, and you can see some stripes. I mean, there, there, there is some physics here, but the interesting thing happens for larger values, which is where you see the, this um, symmetry breaking, which has a net chirality. So this looks something like this, right? You, um, the system has a net chirality in such a way that either the up triangles have one sign of the chirality and the other ones goes to zero or the other way, right? The, the down triangles have a negative chirality and the others add up to zero. So here I show you a bit of the snapshots at low temperatures. Again, this is uh, what this means is that all the physics is in the xy plane. This has temperature and this would mean this the chirality is in 2D. But, I mean, so you have this uh, mermin Wagner, right? But the thing is that even if you don't have long range order, the chirality will hold. So basically what we are presenting here is a model where at low temperatures, at lowest temperatures, you have a symmetry breaking that gives you chirality, which is either positive or negative. And this is something that hasn't been explored in Kagome. The type of chirality you see in Kagome is the one I mentioned earlier where you have this spontaneous symmetry breaking, but the total chirality is zero. Here, the chirality is either one sign or the other, okay? And, okay, what I'm showing you here is how the total chirality behaves as a, as a function of, of the magnetic field at low temperatures, okay? So you have a, so this is adding the, the up triangles and the net triangles, and then I take the modulus, so because this is uh, otherwise this would go to something like this, okay? Depending on the copy of the Monte Carlo simulation, it would be either positive or negative. So in this sense, this is very interesting because to our knowledge, there is only one other case where this sort of thing happens, which is a, a paper by Okubo, Chung, and Kawamura. I believe that Daniel Cabra is probably going to talk about Hermion later. Uh, so I will leave that to, to him. And, but in this particular paper, what I want to, to signal is that in what they see is what they call this hermion anti schermion phases that arises with temperature. So you either have the schermion or the anti schermion So you either have one sign of the chirality or the other sign of the chirality. But there, are, uh, there is an important difference with this model. This is the J1, J3 model in the triangular lattice. The important thing is that this is not the lowest temperature phase. This arises with temperature. So we are interested, and now I'm going to tell you why, to go at low temperatures. So in this sense, our work is different because we have a, a, a total chirality which breaks symmetry at the lowest temperatures. And again, it depends on the sort of study you want to do. Schemions are much larger structure than the magnetic structure unit cell we get for this uh, chirality phase. And okay, so I have been talking a, a lot about these chiral phases and okay, they're interesting in themselves. They, 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 it is a lot of fun to work with this, even if the systems are called frustrated. There is a lot of very nice and very rich and beautiful physics going on. But what do, what do we do with them? And what we're working on right now, and this is a disclaimer, I am just starting to work on this. So I, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not an expert at all. So the idea is to relate this sort of phases to the quantum anomalous Hall effect, okay? So the idea is to study these uh, chiral magnetic models as magnetic backgrounds where uh, electrons are, are coupled, okay? So let me remind you of a very interesting paper also by Nagosa in, in the year 2000 where why what they propose is, okay, let's take these electrons, a hoping Hamiltonian, and they are coupled via Hund coupling to a magnetic structure, which is in the Kagome lattice. And they take this in the limit where this Hund coupling is very strong. So if this coupling is very strong, you can suppose that the spins of the uh, fermions, the electrons, 
are completely aligned with the magnetic structure, okay? So they don't take any particular Hamiltonian for the Kagomelatis. What they propose is, okay, let's have a Q equal zero order where you have some chirality. The chirality here, they, they parameterize it with this angle, which they call the flux, but basically it's the, the chirality in each little triangle. And, okay, so what happens here? This, if you take this limit, basically you have an effective hopping Hamiltonian, but in the effective hopping coupling, you have the phase, the very phase, which it's, it's, it's what will give you rise to the quantum anomalous Hall effect, okay? So since this, everything is ordered, you can, they, they, it is a very nice paper because they calculate the bands, okay? So here are the, the bands for Kagome. This is where you have the Kagome with, let's say this angle would be zero, okay? So, but the thing is that when this angle appears, it, a gap appears, right? This, the, the, the bands separate. So they show that when the Fermi energy lies between the bands, you have a quantized conductivity, okay? So since this is due to the, to the phase, this is a quantum anomalous Hall effect, right? And, okay, so the important thing here is that the background is chiral. So you can see now why we were so interested in studying this chirality in the Kagomelatis and why we are insisting so much on that. And okay, so of course there have been a lot of work on this. And another work I want to show you is the, the work, okay, so the first author is Salpimier and it's also by Lacroix and, and Canals. And in this work, what they do is they go beyond this particular uh, calculation because here is in this particular case, right? It's basically taking this infinite the, and, and they, the, you can do the analytical calculation, calculate the conductivity and the term number. And here they go beyond and they take that model, but play a bit on what happens whether the Hund coupling is strong or it is weaker. And uh, okay, so here I show you their, their results. So this is a two spectrum of the bands, depending on how they parameterize this chirality. And this is the whole conductivity, okay? And you can see that, okay, where you have the, the Fermi energy, this is the conductivity as a function of the Fermi energy. And you have a gap and you have the quantized conductivity. This, of course, is in units of E square H, okay? So what we want to do now is, okay, let's, let's do the same thing, but with the idea of what happens when uh, so we have a lot of these chiral magnetic structures going on. So we have a lot of possibilities to propose as a magnetic background. In particular, it would be interesting to see what happens in these liquid phases, but of course it, it is also more complicated. So the first thing we are starting to do is to work on what happens when we, to this uh, perfect magnetic structures, remember that what here, for example, they propose is a perfect order structure, right? It is not related to any particular Hamiltonian or situation, but now we have a lot of Hamiltonians with chirality. So, okay, let's see what happens when we introduce temperature. They dis introduce disorder in such a way in the magnetic background, and how when, these, when we couple this to the electrons, what happens with the whole conductivity, okay? So you can see that Again, this is why we are interested in very low temperatures, right? Yes, they are, in, in, in this one, there is no Hamiltonian. In our case, we are putting a Hamiltonian. Here, in this particular case, if you want to have something like this, you can just put Kagome with the dialoginski morisha interaction and you have a net chirality. And you can tune that with a, with a magnetic field to see what angle of the chirality you want. Okay, this, this is, uh, so to have a Q equal zero order with chirality in a triangle, uh, you, can, you can do that quite easily, okay? So let's take, for example, that Hamiltonian, but what we're doing here is we are, we are starting by taking one of these models with chirality. So our idea is to use the Hamiltonians, but in this particular plot I'm showing, what we did is we took one of these Q equals zero orders with chirality, 
and we put some thermal fluctuation. We are working during Monte Carlo, but what we do here to just get a feel of what happens with temperature is we do a local fluctuation in each of the spins to see what happens, okay? And what you can clearly see is at very low temperatures, the conductivity is quantized, but of course as you go up with temperature, the features start to erase, okay? So, and this is to a Q equal zero order. For example, the, Hamid, the associated Hamiltonian is this Kagome with a Dialogenes Mauritia. But as I told you before, we have now a, a large family of Hamiltonians. And what is most interesting, this, these Hamiltonians have different features. You have a spontaneous chirality. So it would be interesting to see what happens with your conductivity, to see if you have some spontaneous quantized conductivity. And uh, the idea is so we do this with numerics and to try to do something also analytically in the case, for example, for very strong coupling, which here, since the order in some cases is not Q equals zero, it's a bit a more complicated calculation, but it is very exciting to see what would happen there. And so we are working on that. And if we are lucky, one of us in the next Latin American workshop will come and, and talk about these, these results. So. Basically, what I have talked about is I talked at the beginning about highly frustrated points and some definitions on, on uh, classical spin liquids and the behavior, a review on the behavior on Kagome, and about the extended Kagome Heisenberg model in Kagome and how it gives rise to very interesting phases with chirality. And, so, and some people claim that in the quantum case, this is associated with quantum spin liquids. And I presented you a series of a, a model that depending on the couplings, we have a different sort of amazing physics at low temperature. And in particular, uh, how we're interested in doing that uh, and using that as magnetic backgrounds for electrons and see what happens uh, with the quantum anomalous Hall effect. So thank you for your attention.